Hey guys, Kiwi here. Welcome to my Breaking Bad Season 1 retrospective, where I'll be breaking down every episode of Season 1 and ranking them in a tier list in celebration of Breaking Bad's 15th anniversary this month. Warning is spoilers for Breaking Bad and potentially some of Better Call Saul as well. That being said, let's first hear a word from today's sponsor. This video is sponsored by NordVPN. I'm sure you've heard of them before and for good reason. NordVPN is confirmed by Speedtest to be the fastest VPN out there and it's incredibly easy to use. Connect to one of their 5,400 plus servers across 60 countries with just a single click of a button or even enable auto connect for zero click protection. NordVPN has become more than just a VPN, it's now a powerful cybersecurity tool. Their threat protection blocks intrusive ads and web trackers. Whenever you download a file, threat protection protection inspects it for malware. It also automatically scans URLs and blocks malicious ones. For extra protection, you can also route their traffic through two VPN servers, doubling the encryption. Whether you're at home or on the go, NordVPN will always help you keep your private information safe while browsing online, no matter what device you use. I personally use NordVPN to help bypass geo restrictions on streaming services, allowing you to watch content that may not be available in your country, but is in others. For example, Better Call Saul Season 6 still isn't available on Netflix in North America, with the help of NordVPN, that's no longer an issue. Just simply connect to a UK server and voila, all of Season 6 is at your disposal in 4K and ready to watch. Click the link at the top of the description or in the pinned comment and try out NordVPN for yourself. This limited time offer is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash vividkiwi, go check it out. And get a free bonus month when you sign up using my link. Thank you so much to NordVPN for supporting the channel by sponsoring this video. Speaking of which, let's jump right into it. Season 1, Episode 1, Pilot. The first episode starts with a few quiet shots of the Albuquerque desert, followed by Walt's pants mysteriously falling from the sky as the scene quickly goes from 0 to 100, showing Walt wearing nothing but his underwear and a gas mask, frantically driving an RV down an isolated dirt road. The series does start with a typical, you probably wondered how I ended up here cliche, but to be honest, this cold open has to be one of the most iconic and well done versions of the trope. It's just such a seemingly nonsensical situation filled with mystery that instantly engages the viewer as they most likely have a dozen questions running through their head right off the bat which of course gets logically answered throughout the episode. So Walt crashes the RV and steps outside incredibly frustrated with his situation, throwing his gas mask out of anger. As he hears sirens in the distance, he figures the jig is up and uses a camcorder to record a final message to his family as he plans to die before he can get arrested. The cold open ends with the iconic shot of Walt standing in the middle of the road with just his shirt and underwear as he points his gun out to what he assumes is law enforcement closing in on his position. This opening has been parodied to death by this point and for good reason, as it's one of the most memorable moments out of the entire first season. After the intro credits play for the first time, we jump back in time to Walt celebrating his 50th birthday with his wife Skylar cooking him veggie bacon for breakfast. I love how when Walt Jr. shows up for his first of many breakfast scenes, he completely calls out his taste of the veggie bacon which honestly looks like plastic. This typical character building breakfast scene perfectly builds up the family dynamic of the White family, along with setting up the theme of Walt not being happy with the path that his life has led him down, even though he seemingly has a happy family. After Walt drives himself and Junior to school, this basic classroom scene setting up how Walt teaches chemistry at high school is actually extremely underrated. We see how passionate Walt is about chemistry, but his efforts are underappreciated by students who couldn't care less. Walt speaks about growth, decay, and transformation, which is in a way a metaphor for his life and the new path that he'll be choosing to pave from now on, but let's not get too ahead of ourselves. The first handful of real scenes in this episode is essentially showing Walt's day to day while trying to get across the point of him not being happy with the way his life is going as he seemingly is just going through the motions without a real say. It does a great job expressing how after years of not getting what he wants out of life, any aspirations he may have had are now completely faded away as he's settling with what he has to do in order to make ends meet and provide for his family as much as he can with the next scene showing how he has to even take up a second job at a car wash to help do so. Walt gets humiliated washing one of his students' cars due to his boss forcing him to and he'd rather just continue working at the till, with his reluctance to do so in the first place clearly implying how he's experienced this exact situation before. I got no. We talked about this. I'm short-handed, Walter. What am I to do? As Walt arrives home, he's greeted with a surprise birthday party for his 50th, with Skylar giving him a passive-aggressive whisper about how late he is, undercutting the whole thing. We then get introduced to Walt's extended family through Skylar's sister Marie and her husband Hank, who both kind of unintentionally undermine Skylar and Walt in their own ways. 
with Marie admitting how pregnant Skylar looks along with Hank belittling Walt during a toast. Hank initially comes across as a typical macho man with Walt standing out as the exact opposite as shown by the way that he struggles to even handle Hank's gun. Hank unintentionally steals the life of the party away from Walt, especially since they all tune into the TV to watch a drug bust that Hank was a part of. We not only learn that Hank is a DEA agent, but also how fascinated Walt is by how much money drug dealers can make. Hank gives Walt an open invitation for a drive along in the future, but he clearly doesn't expect him to actually take him up on that offer. We then see a top 10 Breaking Bad cringe moment as Walt gets a pathetic candy J by Skylar. It takes Walt a while to get in the mood due to Skylar nagging him while doing so, which she's completely oblivious to. It's then ruined by her excitement over the bidding of her items on eBay. This scene is purposely hard to watch as his dry sex life is just a cherry on top in regard to how sad his life truly is. Back at the car wash the next day, Walt suddenly collapses and is taken to the hospital in an ambulance. It's here where he learns that he has lung cancer, but he completely disassociates while getting his diagnosis. As if his life can get any more depressing, he's thrown this curveball as his life is seemingly set in stone. He calmly hides his diagnosis from his family, but then lashes out the next day while at the car wash, implying how he's sick and tired of just going through the motions and being pushed around. What? I said f you! And your eyebrows! Wipe down this! This whole bogged on freak out is fairly iconic as Walt tells him off and hilariously insults his bushy eyebrows as he leaves. We then get the incredibly symbolic scene of Walt throwing matches into his pool, with the match igniting and fizzling out when it hits the water being a clear parallel to his entire life and the way he currently feels. It's interesting how you never actually see anyone really use the pool for leisure, as it's instead only ever used to highlight how certain characters feel in regard to what they're going through. As he ponders his life, it's implied that this is the moment that Walt decides to cook in order to provide for his family, as this is when he calls Hank to go on a drive along to watch them bust a lab. Walt of course wants to get first hand experience witnessing what it's like before he dips his toes in himself, with Hank and his partner Gomez being none the wiser. We get some classic Hank and Gomi bickering back and forth as they bet on the ethnicity of the dealer that they're about to bust, which is actually misconstrued as they think that Emilio is Captain Cook, when in reality it's Jesse, which Walt realizes as he witnesses Jesse fleeing from the scene after having some private time with a neighbor. Side note, I absolutely love the soundtrack chosen for this entire show, and I'm not just talking about the brilliant work of Dave Porter, but also the actual music that the creators choose to use, with the first example of this being the song that they have playing while Walt witnesses Jesse escape in his vehicle. The song is called Tamacoon by Rodrigo y Gabriela, apologies if I pronounced any of that wrong, but it gets stuck in my head time and time again even when I'm not even watching the show at all. As I continue my retrospective of this show, I'll be sure to highlight other amazing song choices that the show creators make throughout. Anyways, with Walt realizing that the true dealer that Hank was after is actually a former student of his, he looks up at a school where Jesse's house is and confronts him. Jesse of course initially thinks that Walt is wearing a wire or something and has come to catch him, but all that changes once Walt blackmails Jesse into cooking with him under the threat of turning him in if he doesn't. Even from Walt and Jesse's very first scene together, you can already tell how they have amazing on-screen chemistry no pun intended, as shown by Jesse laughing off the idea of Walt wanting to cook with him, followed by Walt's stone-cold seriousness of the matter. We then cut away to potentially the most forgettable scene out of the entire episode, at least to me, which features Marie helping Skylar wrap up some items that she's selling on eBay. Although this scene doesn't have much substance to it, it does get across the idea that Skylar has less than efficient methods of trying to make money herself on the side, including eBay sales and writing a collection of short stories. But more importantly, it shows off the dynamic between the two sisters as Marie easily annoys Skylar and gets on her nerves without even realizing it. Meanwhile, Walt steals chemistry paraphernalia from his work and brings it all over to Jesse's, who clearly doesn't know a fraction of what Walt does. Walt once again shows his passion for chemistry by getting all giddy and excited to show off all the high-grade equipment that he just stole for them, but he's immediately undercut by Jesse being all stubbornly reluctant and wanting to switch up his methods. Now, this is a volumetric flask. You wouldn't cook in one of these. Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, no, you don't. Walt is adamant about being a stickler for cooking nothing but the highest quality product possible, once again showing his respect for chemistry. I love how Walt laughs at Jesse for not knowing what flask to use in what situation, which is quickly explained by the fact that he failed Jesse when he was once his student, again showing great on-screen chemistry between the two characters due to their vastly different outlooks on, well, chemistry. Did you learn nothing from my chemistry class? No. You flunked me. 
Remember? No wonder. Prick. After Jesse refuses to cook at his own house, he sells Walt on the idea of purchasing an RV to cook out of, so Walt takes out his savings from a Mesa credit union to do so. It's possible that Mesa credit union may have some sort of relation to Mesa Verde from Better Call Saul, but that's another theory for another time. Anyways, here we get the only time in the entire show where a character mentions Breaking Bad as Jesse questions why Walt is doing all of this. Absolutely love this scene as Aaron Paul fully gives it his all and it really shows. Some straight like you giant stick up his ass all of a sudden at age, what, 60? He's just gonna break bad? I'm 50. There's many moments between Walt and Jesse that I love in this show, but this was probably the first real scene that I started to really like Jesse as a character due to just the tremendous job that Aaron Paul does here, plus Walt's response is just the perfect balance of being short and sweet yet incredibly accurate to his character. I mean, if you've, if you, if you've gone crazy or depressed, I'm, I'm just saying, that, that's something I need to know about, okay? I mean, that, that affects me. Plus, this gives us the popular Jesse What meme that I probably overused in my videos a few years ago. I am awake. <laughs> what? In the next scene, Walt continues to show how his secret cancer diagnosis has awakened him by standing up to his son being bullied in a way that he never normally would have by beating up and scaring off the bullies, mocking Junior. His family, of course, has no idea what's gotten into him, with this definitely confirming to Skylar that something has gotten into him, as Marie stated earlier. We then see the start of Walt and Jesse's first cook together out in the desert, and I gotta acknowledge how hilarious it is that Jesse calls a bar in a cow house completely oblivious to his mistake, along with even doubling down as if Walt is the stupid one for not understanding what he's saying. Got some big cow house way out that way, like two miles, but I don't see nobody. Cow house? Yeah, where they live. The cows. Cow house. It's small missable moments like this that really get you to love the show, especially during rewatches where you may have overlooked dialogue like this on your first viewing. Anyways, as Walt strips down to his underwear, the show clearly starts planting more seeds leading up to the cold open, as if the RV wasn't already a big enough hint already. It's hilarious how Brian Cranston apparently insisted to wear tidy whities for this episode in order to make Walt look as humiliating as possible, which continues throughout the show even after so much more character transformation. Jesse also finds this hilarious and stupidly figures that now's a good time as ever to make a home video of sorts of mocking Walt in his underwear, which Walt of course forces him to shut off as he obviously doesn't want any proof of what they're doing. I'm unsure why Jesse thought it was a good or practical idea to bring a camcorder with him as if they're on a family vacation, but him using it to mock Walt does set up why it's even in the RV in the first place to Walt record his farewell to his family as we saw in the cold open. We then get our first cooking montage, which becomes an iconic staple for the show, so it feels nostalgic of sorts watching how it all started and where it all came from. After they finish their cook, Jesse admits his surprise at the high quality product that Walt is able to produce, praising him for creating art, which is also a great callback to Jesse's stubbornness in an earlier scene. And let me tell you something else. This in chemistry, okay, this is art. Oh. Cooking is art, and the shit I cook is the bomb, so don't be telling me. Shit you cook is shit. This is pure glass. You're a goddamn artist. This, this is art. Mr. White? Walt stays humble, just stating how he's glad that his product is satisfactory, unable to fully enjoy the moment like Jesse is. The situation is, however, undercut by Walt telling Jesse that he's not allowed to try out the product, which is a typical struggle when it comes to dealers. We then get introduced to Crazy 8 through Jesse, bringing some of their product to sell them, and to be honest, although I know about Crazy 8 a lot better now due to how many times I've seen both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, I still remember this scene giving me really weird vibes the first time I watched it, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it's due to Crazy 8 randomly training a new attack dog that we never see again in order to introduce himself as intimidating, but I'm not sure, nor I guess does it really matter in the grand scheme of things. I will take this moment to segue into mentioning how interesting it is to go back to the early days of Breaking Bad, as the show creators were just starting out in this universe before it was fully realized. Although the show is one of the goats, it's interesting to see some growing pains in earlier seasons and episodes, as I assume that there are some details that the creators probably wish that they could change or improve with the knowledge of hindsight years later. Anyway, Anyways, Crazy 8 confronts Jesse about how Emilio thinks that he snitched on him, which is credibly ironic considering that Crazy 8 is using this to cover up the fact that he himself is the snitch, but we'll discuss that more in depth later on in the video once it's actually revealed in the show. Regardless, Jesse tries putting on a tough act in order to defend himself, clearly unaware that Emilio is actually upstairs due to Saul Goodman being able to bail him out. Once again, put a pin in that for later, but the point is that this causes Crazy 8 and Emilio to gang up on Jesse and force him to show them where he got this new high 
high quality product from, as they know that he doesn't have the capability to be able to cook it all on his own. So Jesse quickly caves, bringing them to Walt, who's still out in the desert in the RV, but when Emilio recognizes Walt for being there when he got busted, he mistakenly accuses Walt of being DEA himself, seemingly confirming his suspicions that Jesse dimed on him, even though we as the audience know that this is just all a huge misunderstanding. Jesse has the bright idea of frantically trying to run away, making them seem even more guilty before Walt can try to explain the misunderstanding. Jesse then stupidly trips and bashes his face on a rock, knocking himself out, leaving the situation to Walt to handle himself. Walt then convinces Emilio and Crazy Eight to keep him alive long enough for him to teach them his formula, but as he does so, he uses them not knowing chemistry as well as he does to his advantage and creates a toxic phosphine gas, catching them off guard long enough for him to escape, along with trapping them inside the RV, potentially killing them. As Walt holds the RV door shut, trapping them inside, we see the origin of the iconic bullet holes through it as the two inside try shooting him off the door to try and get out, but to no avail. It's also hilarious how right before Walt does this, Crazy Eight stops him, scaring him into thinking that they're onto him, when in reality they're just intimidating him to hurry up. Now, the phosphine gas was also brilliantly foreshadowed multiple times earlier in the episode, first with Walt correcting Hank on it during their drive along, and then again when Walt spoke to Jesse earlier about how the chemicals that they're working with can be incredibly toxic. You mix that shit wrong and you got the uh, mustard gas. Phosphine gas, I think. These chemicals and their fumes are toxic, in case you didn't know that. What's you do them? Red phosphorus in the presence of moisture and accelerated by heat yields phosphorus hydride, phosphine gas. Also, it's worth noting that while Walt was cooking for Emilio and Crazy Eight, Walt convinced Emilio to throw out his cigarette, which of course ended up starting an uncontrollable fire, which snowballs out of control and creates a domino effect with the first causing Walt to panic and flee the scene. Due to the toxic gas in the RV, Walt puts on a gas mask on both Jesse and himself and drives off, bringing us up to speed with the cold open, except with the full context so that it all surprisingly makes complete sense. Which is kinda wild, I mean, who's this man driving an RV in nothing but his underwear and a gas mask, with someone else passed out in the passenger seat also in a gas mask, and why is there two unconscious bodies in the back? Kinda crazy how the show manages to perfectly explain it all with the necessary context, but that's part of what makes this first episode so special and intriguing. In reality, there's no real reason for Walt to be driving away so frantically as he only does so due to the anxiety and adrenaline building up inside of him from the situation at hand. This is also why he assumes the sirens are police coming to chase him down when, in reality, it's revealed to only be a few fire trucks sent out to handle the fire caused by Emilio's cigarette continuing the domino effect that that caused. Now while Walt stands there in the middle of the road with a gun waiting for who he assumes is the police, he actually tries taking his own life but he's saved by the safety of the gun, only to shoot it off to the side of him once he puts the safety off, which is a brutal enough moment in itself, but becomes even more brutal when you realize that the sirens aren't even the police and that he almost just took his life when he didn't need to. Not that you ever should need to, but my point is that his original reason for doing so turned out to be wrong. Also, let me just take this moment to again point out the brilliant song choices for this episode, first with Dead Fingers Talking by working for a nuclear-free city during Walt and Jesse's first cook montage, along with Apocalypse shit by Molotov during Walt's frantic RV escape, and then when he finally realizes that the sirens are actually fire trucks. Now I mention these because instead of using typical mainstream music at the time that most shows would, the Breaking Bad creators have brilliant talent at choosing music that you probably have never heard of, yet still perfectly fits the situations that they're chosen for, just like the song earlier of Walt witnessing Jesse first escaping the drug bust. So Jesse wakes up and Walt undermines the entire situation by just stating that they need to clean up, and the episode ends with Walt surprisingly frisky in bed with Skylar, directly contrasting their dull sex life that we not only saw earlier in the episode, but that Marie also called out Skylar for. Obviously, Walt's sex drive is now skyrocketing after doing something so life-threatening and illegal. This episode gets a solid A tier, as it's probably one of the best pilot episodes that I've ever seen and for very good reasons. Although it's a slow burn, it still has good pacing as it does a great job introducing and setting up all the main characters of Season 1, while also perfectly painting the picture to explain in context why the cold open makes sense. There's a lot more that I could potentially say about this episode, but in fear of this video becoming like 4 hours long or something, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to episode 102. That being said, I still may return to this episode in the future and even dedicate an entire video just to it due to how much I really do love it, so let me know if you'd like to see that in the future. Season 1 Episode 2 
The Cat's in the Bag. Episode 2 starts out pretty much where Episode 1 ended off in regard to picking right back up after Walt and Skylar finish off, so to speak, followed by Walt needing to go to the bathroom to splash some water on his face as the physical activity winded him due to his lung cancer, which Skylar obviously doesn't know about, causing her to become worried if he's okay. We then get a flashback to 12 hours earlier, showing how Walt and Jesse cleaned up the RV situation. They bribe a tow truck guy with money coated in chemicals in order to keep things a secret, as their blamed excuses clearly aren't cutting it. It's a fairly comedic moment that gets me every time. Like I said, we couldn't be more grateful. So they get towed out of the ditch, but as Walt starts the RV to leave, he struggles to do so, potentially foreshadowing Season 2 Episode 9, Four Days Out, as they struggle to start the RV time and time again throughout both seasons. I love how they finally celebrate together for the first time after getting the RV to start, even just after having a huge argument due to the frustration of the situation that they're in. Their celebration is, however, undercut for multiple reasons, with the first being the realization that Crazy Eight's still alive. Then, unbeknownst to them, the camera pans down from outside the RV to show the gas mask that Walt had previously thrown away out of anger, setting up the end of the episode to come full circle. We then jump forward to the morning after Walt's sexy time with Skylar to reveal that Walt actually fell asleep on the bathroom floor, something that Skylar is clearly suspicious and worried about. Then, as if that wasn't enough, Jesse calls their house due to freaking out over how Crazy Eight's still alive, with Walt doing a terrible job covering it up. It's funny how Jesse making calls directly to the house becomes a recurring trend in the show that he never seems to learn from, even though his first time doing so backfires badly due to Skylar calling back the number after Walt leaves, revealing who Walt was really talking to. Skylar looks up Jesse's number online using a reverse phone tracking website and manages to find not only all of Jesse's information, but a hilariously over-the-top website that Jesse made of himself about being a dealer and wannabe gangster under his Captain Cook alias. This is extremely stupid and unrealistic for Jesse to have this as a public website, but to be honest, considering Jesse, I wouldn't put it past him for being this careless. So Walt goes to work, but while teaching his class, he's visibly shaken up over the idea that he's killed someone, clearly shown by his misinterpretation of a student saying, Is this going to be on the midterm? To, Is this going to be on the murder? It's kind of crazy that Walt still decided to go into work that day instead of calling in sick, since even though it makes sense to try and keep up appearances as if everything's fine, he's clearly not very good at it. I suppose it does work to his advantage though, since after school is over, he's able to swipe some bottles of hydrofluoric acid to help dispose of the bodies. Meanwhile, Jesse tries poorly covering up his black eye with some makeup, creating the trend of seeing each main character from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul eventually do the same as well. Now his beauty time is cut short, however, due to realizing that Crazy 8 has escaped, but luckily Walt catches him on his way over. As Walt confronts Crazy 8, he hilariously runs away in fear right into a tree, allowing Walt to just casually kidnap him in broad daylight and bring him back to Jesse's. So as Walt returns Crazy 8 to Jesse's house, he gives Jesse a hard time for allowing him to wander down the street, when in reality that never would have happened if Walt would have just gone there earlier instead of going to work. This starts the trend throughout the show of Walt and Jesse both equally being at fault for the situations that they find themselves in for different reasons, making it hard to just blame one or the other. When Walt requests information about Crazy 8, Jesse doesn't even know what his name means, which is kind of hilarious considering we see the origin of the Crazy 8 nickname in Better Call Saul. I assume that the creators created the nickname during these early episodes of Breaking Bad to be purposely nonsensical, which may be what influenced them to give an actual explanation for it in Better Call Saul since Jesse couldn't hear. Start with his name at least. Crazy 8. Crazy 8, what the hell does that even mean? <sighs> I don't know, man, okay? It means like, like crazy eight, okay? I don't know. So as Walt tries asking Jesse if Crazy Eight will listen to reason if they let him go, Jesse brings up a hypothetical of Crazy Eight returning to give them Colombian neckties, which is something that we know Tuco would actually do, as Tuco references such during the beginning of Better Call Saul. I don't think Crazy Eight would have it in him to actually be that brutal, but he does work for the Salamancas, so it's not completely out of the question. Also, yes, I know that Colombian neckties are unfortunately a real thing and that <laughs> Vince didn't create the idea or anything, but it's just interesting to see how the creators use the same ideas from Breaking Bad 
had to incorporate them into the story of Better Call Saul, even if it's just simple dialogue. Anyways, while they're in the middle of discussing Crazy 8, they realize that he's woken up, and they start freaking out over the fact that they stupidly never tied him up. Jesse grabs a bike lock to lock Crazy 8 up to a pole in his basement, and I find it funny how Jesse even first tries it out himself to make sure that he can't slip it over his head and escape. So now that the Crazy 8 waking up situation has been handled, at least temporarily, it's back to square one. And I love how Walt reacts to Jesse constantly asking him what to do next, showing how even though Jesse is technically an adult, he still looks up to Walt as being an experienced adult who must have all the answers, also relating back to their teacher-student dynamic from high school. So now, what do we do? You keep asking me that like you think I have some answer. Walt and Jesse start arguing once more about their current situation, throwing blame back and forth due to Jesse being mad at Walt for not having a perfect explanation for absolutely everything. Walt then shifts their focus from dealing with Crazy 8 to dealing with Emilio's body, but Jesse becomes taken back by Walt suggesting that they should dissolve his body in acid. Since Jesse's been best friends with Emilio since high school and even elementary, this adds yet another layer of this forum. As if doing it to someone random wasn't bad enough, it'd be even worse having to do it to someone you've known for your entire life and have worked with closely for years. And I can't believe I haven't mentioned this already, but it's just so wild how off the rails Walt and Jesse's journey has already gone. They went from just wanting to cook, which is already bad enough as it is, to now murder and hiding the bodies through extreme measures. To state the obvious, they're clearly in way over their heads, which will continue throughout the entirety of the show. The thing is, since this show is such a realistic slow burn, it just makes these situations have such a greater impact than other shows would, which really makes it hit that much harder than usual. So Walt realizes that since they have to worry about disposing of Emilio's body along with killing Crazy 8, he suggests flipping a coin to decide who does what. I love the detail of building up how much Jesse doesn't want to dissolve Emilio's body, but then when he's faced with the idea of taking Crazy 8's life, he instantly backpedals and insists on taking care of Emilio's body instead, as it's technically the easier job of the two. Walt already realized this, however, and insists that they flip a coin to essentially decide who has to handle Crazy 8. Now this is ultimately a moot point as they'll eventually have to take care of Crazy 8's body as well, so it's essentially Walt trying to get out of having to take another life, but of course the coin flip lands in Jesse's favor, forcing Walt to do so anyways. So Jesse leaves Walt at his house to take care of Crazy 8 while he goes out to buy plastic bins that hydrofluoric acid won't dissolve through, but Jesse naively doesn't think to dismember the body, which is kind of psychopath behavior so I don't blame him, but because of this he doesn't buy the plastic bins as he doesn't think the body would fit. Meanwhile, Walt searches Jesse's house for a potential murder weapon, but wimps out when he goes down to do the deed due to Crazy 8 waking up and spotting him. So instead, Walt decides to fulfill Crazy 8's request of water, along with bringing him food and a bucket to go to the bathroom in, implying that Walt doesn't intend on getting it over with so quickly anymore. In order to ease his nerves, Walt decides to smoke one up, but hilariously struggles to roll his first J. Jesse returns to witness Walt getting high, with Jesse going from being happily surprised to angry when he realizes that Walt is smoking his kush. Are you smoking weed? Oh my god. Wait a minute, is that, is that my weed? <laughs> Jesse admits how he didn't buy any plastic bins and then he asks Walt if he did his job, but Crazy 8 still coughing from the basement pretty much answers that. So they've both failed at their tasks and Walt walks out on Jesse once again putting their problems on hold until the following day. Walt's left due to being late for an ultrasound appointment with Skylar, where they find out that their baby will be a girl. When Walt says how that's what he was hoping for, he's hit with a hard realization after Skylar responds by stating how he'll regret wishing for a daughter when she's 16 and starts dating, as Walt knows that he'll never live long enough to watch his daughter grow up, with this probably being the first time that he's ever thought of that. This clearly upsets Walt, who tries to hide it, but Skylar can still tell that something's off. She uses this moment to take the opportunity to question Walt about who Jesse Pinkman is, confronting him over the fact that she knows that it was Jesse who he was secretly talking to that morning. Walt gives the excuse that Jesse's selling him kush as that's most likely the first thing that came to mind considering that he was just smoking up at Jesse's moments ago. When Skylar mildly freaks out at Walt for being so stupid as to get into pot due to his brother-in-law being a DEA agent, Walt tells Skylar to get off his ass but in a hilariously genuine and polite manner that just leaves her speechless. So right now, what I need is for you to climb down out of my ass. Although Skylar is technically in the right here, since Walt's the protagonist and we've been following what he's been going through, I can't help but side with him in this moment. Will you do that for me, honey? Will you please, just once, get off my ass? You know, I'd appreciate it. 
I really would. But also, Skylar telling Waltz that he's stupid for getting involved with drugs due to Hank being a DEA agent is a huge understatement considering what Walt is really up to in regard to cooking Crystal. So while Walt is at work the next day, Jesse smokes up some of the product to hype himself up to take care of Emilio's body, however while moving it, Skylar White Yo shows up to confront him to stay away from Walt. I may have jumped the gun, yo, but this is definitely another top 10 cringe breaking bad moment, yo. That being said, I do get quite a laugh out of the scene whenever I rewatch it. From the misunderstanding of Jesse thinking that Walt truly did tell Skylar everything that's happened, to his confused realization that Walt told her that he sold him pot, along with the fact that Jesse being tweaked out of his mind certainly doesn't help the situation as he frantically tries averting her attention away from the dead body at the top of his driveway. So after Skylar leaves, Jesse hilariously struggles to drag Emilio's body up the stairs, and side note, it's kind of wild how the show makes a realistic depiction of moving a dead body so comedic considering how dark of a subject matter it obviously is. Now in Jesse's tweaked out state, he decides to dissolve Emilio's body in his bathtub, all while talking to himself, venting about how much Walt has screwed up his home. Walt finally arrives at Jesse's after work, and Jesse instantly confronts Walt about how Skylar confronted him and threatened him with Hank. Jesse gives Walt a hard time for not wearing the pants in the family, which I just realized gets hilariously called back to in like a season and a half from now, but we'll get to that in a future video. Anyways, Walt admits that he told Skylar that Jesse sold him weed due to it seeming like the lesser of two evils compared to actually telling her the truth about what's been going on. Jesse then starts acting all high and mighty in regard to just using his bathtub instead of having to run around town to find specific plastic bins to use, but as Walt puts two and two together, realizing Jesse's mistake, it's too little too late, as we get the iconic scene of Emilio's liquefied body completely breaking through the ceiling. Now this show came out long before the boys or anything like that, so even though this might seem kinda mild now in like 2023, back when this episode first aired, this was incredibly gruesome, especially for cable TV. It's from this moment forward that both Walt and Jesse have their own realizations. Jesse realizes that he should trust Walt in regard to his knowledge of science, and Walt realizes that he should explain that science to Jesse so that he doesn't screw things up like we just saw here. On another side note, I feel like I'll be overusing the word iconic throughout my Breaking Bad retrospective, so sorry if that's the case, but I just can't help it. There's so many incredibly famous moments in this show, and that's just the first word that comes to mind to accurately describe said situations. Anyways, the episode ends with a mysteriously somber scene of two children running through the desert, with one of them finding Walt's old gas mask. She picks it up and plays with it, and the episode ends, and I love when shows do this. By that I mean when a show shows something seemingly insignificant and or mysterious near the beginning of an episode, but then so much crap happens throughout the episode that you completely forget about it until that seemingly insignificant thing returns by the end and proves to be a bigger deal than you initially thought. This episode gets a solid B tier. It definitely holds my interest, especially in regards to the amount of Walt and Jesse dynamic that we see as they struggle to work together and solve the situation that they put themselves in. There's many great moments throughout, but nothing absolutely mind-blowing per se. Season 1 Episode 3 and the bags in the river. This episode starts out with a mix between Walt and Jesse cleaning up the mess that Emilio has become, contrasted with a flashback of Walt and Gretchen breaking down all the chemical components of a body. Walt and Gretchen theorizing the idea that there has to be more to a human body than that contrasts perfectly with Walt now mopping up the remains of one and flushing it down the toilet. But it definitely gives me chills every time I watch it, as it's just perfectly done in my opinion, and we will return to this by the end of the episode. Now after the intro sequence, we cut to Skylar painting what will be Holly's room, as Marie just sits around to watch. Two fun missable details about this, one, Skylar telling Walt Jr. how much she hates hearing him say yo due to her previous confrontation with Jesse, and two, the fact that she's even painting the walls herself, which is something that she had nagged Walt about during the first episode, which he clearly still hasn't done. Skylar tries asking Marie about what her experience of smoking weed was like in the past under the ruse that she's working on a stoner character for one of her short stories, but Marie quickly deduces that she's actually talking about a family member. However, she misses interprets it as Junior being the one who's blazing, since that's the more logical conclusion compared to Walt himself. I find it funny how Skylar tries convincing Marie that she's wrong by swearing to God that Junior isn't getting high, which is technically true, but seems a bit sleazy to do. Meanwhile, after Walt and Jesse hose each other off from cleaning up Emilio, Walt empties Crazy 8's crap bucket, which is comparatively not seeming so bad anymore after just dumping Emilio down the toilet. 
Now, Crazy Eight confronts Walt by trying to get him to turn against Jesse. This somewhat works as Walt busts in on Jesse in his bathroom lighting up, to which he practically assaults him and tries flushing their badge worth $40,000 down the toilet. Walt blames Jesse for being such a junkie, but Jesse manages to grab it and tosses out the window, causing them to childishly race each other to see who can go get it first, giving us this gem of a meme. <laughs> Anyways, Walt eventually catches up to Jesse and drags him out of his car before he can drive away, but Jesse confronts Walt on still having a job to do and drives off leaving him to it after giving a hilarious and sensitive well, Heil Hitler, bitch! giving yet another Jesse line that the show got away with in 2008, but I'm not sure if they would now. Meanwhile, we get initial development about Marie's klepto problem, moving on. Ah, uh, just kidding, there's actually more to the scene than that, as this is when Marie calls Hank about how she thinks that Walt Jr. is smoking pot and asks him to scare Jr. off of it. So we see Hank bringing Jr. to the Crossroad Motel, aka the Crystal Palace, where we get our introduction to everyone's favorite hooker, Wendy. This goes down about how you'd expect, with Jr. having no clue what the heck Hank's talking about. As it turns out, Jesse's in a motel room there waiting on Wendy for her services, but gets spooked about how she just spoke to a cop, unaware how that's actually Walt's brother-in-law. Small world. So while Jesse's enjoying that, Walt is back at Jesse's place creating a list of pros and cons in regard to letting Crazy 8 go versus killing him, but no matter how many pros Walt can think of, it doesn't outweigh the single con that is the fact that Crazy 8 will kill him and his entire family. Walt realizes what time it is and calls Skylar pretending to be at the car wash, but Skylar confronts him over the fact that she just called Bogdan wondering where he was and discovered that Walt quit the car wash weeks ago. Caught in his lie, Walt gets told by Skylar to stay wherever he is for the night and she hangs up on him. Walt hears Crazy 8 yelling at him from the basement, so he makes him another sandwich, this time being considerate enough to cut off the crust for him. Walt brings down the sandwich, but he passes out at the bottom of the stairs due to his illness, dropping the plate on the ground, shattering it. As Walt wakes up, Crazy 8 confronts him on how he knocked himself out solely through coughing, to which Walt admits to him that he has lung cancer, making Crazy 8 the first person that he tells this to. Whether Walt admits it to him due to Crazy 8 being so far removed from his normal life, or if Walt thinks it's because Crazy 8 won't live to tell the tale, I'm not sure, but it's still incredibly interesting how this is the first time Walt has openly spoken about it. As Walt goes upstairs, Stairs to make another sandwich, he decides to bring down a six pack of beer to share between the two of them, as Walt is clearly looking for any reason possible to not kill him. Walt figures that maybe if he can humanize Crazy 8 and relate to him on a certain level, that it'll deter him away from wanting to kill him, which actually starts to work. Walt learns that his real name is Domingo, which I've been struggling to not call him by this whole time considering Better Call Saul, but I digress. In reality, Walt humanizing Domingo is actually just making the situation harder on himself, as eventually having to kill him will just just make it that much more difficult and personal. Of course, I'm jumping the gun here as Walt currently hopes that it won't come to that, but assuming you've watched the show already, we all know what this will come down to. You getting to know me is not gonna make it easier for you to kill me. There is hell I'm looking for any reason not to. I mean, any good reason at all. Sell me. Plus, Domingo even calls out Walt on this, causing Walt to admit that he is looking for any good reason not to have to kill him, which is obviously naive as Domingo will want to say anything that he can to give Walt the benefit of the doubt, which Walt practically begs him to do. Even though Walt does clearly have it in him to kill Domingo, he still doesn't want to. Domingo tells Walt everything that he wants to hear, but also admits that he knows that anyone in his situation would tell Walt this in order to get set free. In fear of overstating the obvious, I absolutely love how the show doesn't beat around the bush here in regard to Walt admitting that he wants Domingo to sell him on why he shouldn't kill him, along with Domingo calling out the entire thing. I guess I'd start off by promising that if you let me go, I won't come after you, that you'd be safe. But you know that anybody in my situation will make promises like that. And though in my case, they happen to be true. You never know for sure. It almost feels like them going against the grain and breaking their own fourth wall by talking about what should remain unspoken, making this just feel that more realistic. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the many reasons why I absolutely love this show. It takes something that normal shows would gloss over and humanizes it in an incredibly realistic way. How many action movies have you seen where countless people get killed without a second thought, when in reality, taking a human life is infinitely more complicated than that? This is why I love the Crazy 8 arc so much, as it's the perfect introductory three-episode arc to start off the show and get you invested in it, at least in my opinion. 
So Walt and Domingo drop the tension and actually start relating to each other in regard to Domingo's family business, which does start to open Walt up to him, shown by him actually handing Domingo a beer instead of just rolling him one. Walt then admits how Domingo is the first person he's told his cancer diagnosis to, causing Domingo to realize that Walt is cooking in order to provide for his family before he dies. Domingo essentially convinces Walt to set him free, but as Walt goes upstairs to grab the key, he starts thinking about how he was unconscious for a while in front of Domingo with a broken plate and considers the possibility that Domingo swiped a shard of it. As Walt puts the pieces together from the trash, he frantically searches the rest of the trash can for the missing piece, praying to God that what he assumes isn't true, even though he knows that it is. It's kind of ironic since after all the time talking to each other, with Walt hoping that Domingo can convince him not to kill him, Domingo actually solidifies the fact that Walt should, as Walt discovers that in fact a piece of the broken glass is missing, implying that Domingo pocketed it and is waiting for the moment that Walt releases him so that he can use that shard on him to kill him. No, no, don't do this. Don't do this. Why are you doing this? This results in Walt confronting him about it right before he unlocks the bike lock, causing Walt to feel forced to strangle him to death with it. Out of all the ways to kill someone, strangulation is typically considered to be one of the most personal, with Walt even saying I'm sorry over and over again while he does so. Domingo manages to get a few successful stabs at Walt's leg, but to no avail, as he's already essentially dead. The way that you see the life drained from Crazy Eight's body as his swings become less and less aggressive is absolutely brutal, with the show successfully making the audience feel the exact same way that Walt does about the whole ordeal. So Jesse arrives the following morning to find that both Walt and Crazy Eight are gone, along with any evidence of them or Emilio ever being there. We then see the principal of Walt's school filling in for him as he's apparently called in sick. It's interesting how Walt didn't call in sick back when he needed to deal with Crazy Eight and Emilio, but now he does after the fact, implying how he went to work previously almost as a form of procrastination of the inevitable, but now that he's taking care of Crazy Eight, he calls in sick after all. Meanwhile, we see the continuation of the domino effect of Emilio's cigarette finally coming to its ultimate conclusion, as the firemen extinguishing the fire revealed to law enforcement the fact that Crazy Eight's vehicle was left at the cook site. Since Crazy Eight is actually implied to be a CI for Hank and Gomi, this led them out there to search the car, leading Hank to find a sample of Walt's first cook, which Hank is surprised by due to how pure it appears to be. So not only do they already suspect that someone took out Crazy Eight, but since Walt left his gas mask behind, it confirms to Hank and Gomi that the crystal that they found was in fact cooked there. Not only do I absolutely love the idea of the fire and the gas mask causing Hank and Gomi to catch onto Walt's trail so quickly, but this also continues the trend that although Hank is obviously great at his job, he's still always one step behind Walt, as we'll discuss more in the future. Finally, the episode ends with Walt sitting in his car at an overpass contemplating his actions as we once again flash back to him speaking with Gretchen about the chemical components of the human body. If it wasn't already obvious, the flashback is supposed to represent Walt thinking back to this moment himself, which makes the flashback that much more impactful in my opinion. Gretchen suggests how the idea of the soul is the missing component to the equation, which again sends shivers down my spine whenever I watch this scene. Also, the flashback concluding with Walt telling Gretchen that there's nothing but chemistry here obviously has a double meaning, also implying the romantic chemistry between the two of them. Walt then arrives home knowing that he has to give Skylar some sort of explanation in regard to his recent actions, so the episode ends with him admitting how there's something that he needs to tell her, making you wonder if he's going to open up to her about the truth of what he's been up to. Honestly, this episode gets an S tier. I feel kind of crazy for rating it above the pilot, but to be honest, I'd be lying to you if I said that the Crazy 8 situation wasn't what initially made me fall in love with this show. As good as the first two episodes are, especially the pilot, I feel like this is the episode where the show finally gets its groove. It's just so down to earth, realistic, and relatable in regard to meeting a stranger and finding out you have more in common than you initially thought, even to the point that your paths may have previously crossed without you even realizing it. Did you work there too? Only my whole life. 16 years ago, how old would you have been? It was after school, trust me, I was there. Might have even helped bring you up. You and your extended warranty on the crib. Their acting along with the writing just genuinely sells it that well. Then, after all of that, Walt getting a moment of clarity and realizing that he still has to kill Crazy Eight is completely heartbreaking, even if you saw it coming. 
Even knowing the inevitable, the show still set the situation up in such a way where you've become just as invested in Domingo as Walt has just for it all to come crashing down. As Domingo initially told Walt, getting to know him wouldn't make it easier to kill him. Season 1 Episode 4 Cancer Man. This episode starts out with the full reveal that Crazy A was actually a confidential informant for the DEA, and more specifically, Hank and Gomez. Kind of wild how, although it's blatantly stated here, along with hinted at previously, it's a very missable detail that many viewers gloss over and don't really acknowledge or realize until a rewatch. This may be due to the fact that it's only revealed after Crazy Eight's death, but this information makes the first episode just make that much more sense. I assume that since Hank and Gomi were planning to bust Captain Cook in the first episode during Walt's drive along, that Crazy Eight actually mainly wanted to rat out Jesse, not Emilio, but that Emilio was the one arrested due to being the one at the lab when Jesse was out. This may be why Crazy Eight was mad at Jesse for getting away and used this to blame him as the snitch in order to hide Emilio being suspicious of himself. Now, keep in mind that Jesse and Emilio were equal partners, so Crazy Eight probably knew that he'd still be ratting out his cousin as well, even if he wasn't the main target. Crazy Eight actually being the one to technically rat out Emilio is a great detail that I'm glad was included in the show, as it gives these characters even more depth even after their deaths, and also explains how Hank knew to bust Emilio in the first place. Also, mild Better Call Saul spoilers, but I love how this gets elaborated on in the prequel as we found out how Crazy Eight initially became Hank's CI during Better Call Saul Season 5 which is one of my favorite arcs of the show. Anyways, this scene also tells us that Walt's first batch of product was the purest that the DEA has ever seen, clocking in at a whopping 99.1%. Plus, they believe that it was cooked right in Albuquerque due to them finding Walt's gas mask near Crazy Eight's abandoned vehicle, leading them to accurately assume that the location was used as a cook site as they swabbed the mask and found traces of the same 99.1 pure product. This scene ends with an amazing contrast between Hank hyping up how highly skilled Walt is, calling him a potential new kingpin, while cutting to Walt unflatteringly brushing his teeth in his underwear. We then cut to Walt uncomfortably zoning out at some barbecue that he's cooking, as he's most likely having flashbacks to cleaning up Emilio's remains. Hank snaps him back to reality as they're revealed to be having a classic family barbecue. This starts out wholesome as Hank motivating Junior to get girls transitions into Walt explaining the story of how he met Skylar, but the mood gets abruptly ruined due to Skylar breaking down in tears and leaving while telling the whole family to ask Walt what's wrong. It's revealed that the cliffhanger at the end of the last episode was a slight misdirect, as in Instead of telling Skylar about what he's really been doing with Jesse, he tries excusing his recently odd behavior by admitting to her that he has cancer. So Skylar gets upset in this moment due to Walt reminiscing over how they first met, hitting her incredibly hard due to his cancer, along with the fact that Walt made her still keep it a secret from the rest of the family and pretend that everything's okay, which was unfair for him to do even if it is his business. The name of the episode Cancer Man accurately represents all of this, as this is the episode that Walt's whole family learns about his diagnosis Lung cancer. It's bad. Along with Walt having to deal with their reactions to it, which is something that he previously told Crazy Eight that he wasn't even remotely ready to deal with, explaining why he kept this as a secret from his family for so long. Although Walt's family wants to help him, they do so by taking a step in the obvious direction, treatment, assuming how Walt will automatically want to go along with it. Although he does initially agree with their opinions to keep them happy and avoid arguments, as the episode continues, we realize how Walt truly feels. But before we get into that, as Walt and Hank are left alone in the living room, Hank confides in Walt by saying that no matter what, he'll always be there to take care of Walt's family. This is one of those moments where what he says has good intentions but can be taken the wrong way, as Walt's ego causes him to become subtly offended by this as he wants to be able to provide for his family on his own. Meanwhile, we get introduced to Combo and Skinny Pete as they hang out with Jesse at his place, but they initially come across as kinda shitty fake friends as they instantly want to bounce the second and Jesse doesn't want to light up some crystal. To give them the benefit of the doubt, Jesse did just brag about cooking the best batch ever just to not want to smoke any, but they should be able to respect his decision to not want to do hardcore drugs. Jesse of course eventually gives in due to peer pressure and fear of his friends leaving, so he whips out some of his new batch from with Walt. Also, Jesse could have just given Skinny and Combo some while not having any himself, but I guess he didn't want to come across as a pussy or something, I don't know. I don't really have much to say about the following biker hallucination scene other than the fact that it definitely proves how paranoid Crystal makes Jesse, along with the fact that the bikers being revealed as Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever is pretty hilarious. 
Later on, we see Walt changing the bandages to his stab wounds from Crazy 8, which is a forgettable detail that I actually really like, as it shows how realistic Breaking Bad is in regard to characters having injuries when most other shows or forms of entertainment would instantly forget about it and pretend that they're magically healed and fine now. Anyways, Walt confronts Skyler over how much his potential medical bills will cost as their insurance doesn't cover it. Not only does he not want to leave his family with a pile of medical bills once he's gone, his ego causes him to refuse to lean on the financial aid of Hank among others which the next episode elaborates on. Skylar also confronts Walt over the fact that he hasn't told his mother about his cancer which is careful foreshadowing for season 2. So Walt says how he'll borrow money from his pension to cover the medical expenses when in reality he is also potentially going to lean on the money that he got from the Crazy 8 Desert situation. Junior almost catches him doing so and confronts him on how he's downplaying the severity of the situation which is clearly affecting him. I also love how the scene ends with the camera panning over to the crib in the room having the Tampico label on it, referencing the talk Walt had with Domingo about how he bought Junior's crib from Domingo's family store. This subtly implies how although Walt's acting like nothing serious is going on in regard to his cancer, there's a lot more going on in Walt's life that his family doesn't know about which is preoccupying his attention. With this also feeling like Crazy 8's ghost is constantly constantly looming over him. As Walt makes his way to the bank, we get a, oh no, the cops are behind me cliche as Walt freaks out into thinking that he's somehow caught for murder, but when he pulls over, they just drive past him. So as he arrives at the bank, Ken Wins arrives right on time to swipe his parking spot, with Walt becoming distracted by staring at him once inside, bottling up his anger towards him. Moving on, we see Junior staying after school to wait for Walt to take him home, implying that Junior is clearly worried about his dad and wants to spend more time with him now that he knows how he potentially will won't be around for much longer, probably wanting to cherish every moment with them that he can. We then get introduced to Jesse's family as Jesse's tweaked out and paranoid mind somehow led him straight into their backyard. Although Jesse's family is incredibly important to his character, this introduction to them does feel somewhat bland and forgettable and to be honest I don't really care for it. So Jesse is apparently one of those typical kids who would always get in trouble but would tell his parents anything they'd want to hear in order to give him a second chance even though he never truly changed. After they let him sleep off the drugs, he asks them what time dinner is as if nothing's changed. But when they leave him alone to set the table, the camera focusing on Jesse implies how he's self-aware enough to know what he's doing along with how his parents feel about him. Jesse catches up with his younger brother Jake but their parents feel weary or nervous having Jesse hanging around Jake with the door closed which may be just justified but comes across as incredibly rude and uncomfortable as they are clearly wanting to shelter Jake from Jesse due to feeling like Jesse is a bad influence on him even though Jesse is trying to make a blatant effort to reach out to Jake to be closer to him as an older brother from now on. Also Jesse initially feels undermined by how successful the kid Jake is in regard to all of his awards making him think that Jake is the number one son of the family while Jesse himself is a failure. Jake then admits how Jesse is all their parents talk about implying that Jake feels equally envious towards Jesse as Jesse does towards him, with this potentially fueling why Jake works so hard to get all those awards in order to impress his parents as he constantly strives for the amount of attention that their parents instead divert to Jesse himself, again implying how much they do truly care about him. I can appreciate the way that the creators wrote Jesse's family dynamic, especially since their parents kick Jesse out after the maid finds a joint, which Jesse takes the blame for even though it's actually surprisingly Jake's. Since the creators obviously needed to show Jesse doing something while temporarily separated from Walt, it makes sense that they'd want to use the opportunity to flesh out his character by introducing his family into the show. Speaking of which, Jesse foolishly shows up at Walt's house out of the blue, causing Walt to accuse him of wearing a wire as he's still so incredibly paranoid about the murders they committed. Jesse reveals that he wants to continue cooking with Walt after managing to completely sell out the first batch and that he has Walt's share for him. Again, I love the chemistry between these two characters, from Jesse hilariously not knowing how to ease into the conversation. Maybe we could, thought we could debrief. Debrief? Wow, that's, that's what you think we need, debrief? Tim throwing Walt's money in there when Walt treats him poorly. Walt and Skyler then meet with a doctor to discuss chemo, but Walt understandably zones out as he's read all the potential side effects, which is a great way to portray Walt's reluctance about it all without even needing to say a word. Back at home, Walt finally opens up about how he doesn't like feeling like he's being forced into treatment as he doesn't want to die, leaving his family in debt. This clearly crushes Junior, who lashes out at Walt for not being willing to fight for his life. Maybe treatment isn't the way to go. Then why don't you just fucking die already? Just give up and die. 
The episode ends with the scene of Walt pulling into a gas station due to having such a bad coughing fit while driving to the point that he starts coughing up blood. As he sits there, he notices Ken Wins pull in and decides to exact revenge on him by sabotaging his vehicle to catch on fire, showing how this is the moment that Walter White became Heisenberg. This iconic moment may very well be Walt taking out all of the bottled up anger and frustration in his life on a seemingly unrelated man who mildly did wrong him earlier in the episode, but Ken is built up to be such a selfishly oblivious and ignorant prick that you can't help but cheer for Walt as he does so. This episode gets a C tier. Although I still enjoy the episode for what it brings to the table, it's definitely the weakest episode out of the entire first season in my opinion. Yes, Walt's family finding out about his diagnosis is definitely extremely important, but the episode still feels fairly boring and bland during rewatches. Season 1 Episode 5 Grey Matter. This episode begins with Jesse out job hunting, but he gets told that he doesn't have the job requirements for a professional sales position. He tries talking himself up due to having tentacle sales experience as a dealer, but that just hinders him more than it helps him due to how vague he has to be about it, obviously raising suspicion. Now as he realizes that he has no true qualifications, we get introduced to Badger, who's actively working as a sign spinner, which is the no experience necessary job that Jesse turned down. As they meet up in Smoke a J, Jesse had admits that he may be retiring from Cooking Crystal, Badger motivates him to stay in the game by mentioning how he can get him pseudo in order to cook up another batch. Since Jesse never set his life up to have a proper career, he's faced with the ultimatum of either working a humiliating job like Badger or returning to dealing. Gee, I wonder which option he ends up choosing. Meanwhile, Walt and Skylar go to a party at Gretchen and Elliot's place, giving our first real introduction to the characters, even though Gretchen was technically introduced in a flashback during episode 3. Walt is clearly reluctant to go, but Skylar tells them that they need this, wanting to get away from all the drama of his condition to go out and enjoy themselves for once. As they arrive, they greet Gretchen and Elliot, with Walt initially trying to take the high road, grinning through his teeth while telling them how it's nice to see them, along with complimenting them on how well Grey Matter is doing, even though he's clearly envious of it. Walt momentarily excuses himself to go admire the inside of their house, but knowing the full context of Walt's relationship with him, he's clearly envious of the lavish life that they're living, as he feels like he deserves everything that they have. As he rejoins the party, he notices Skylar speaking to Elliot alone, but he gets interrupted by getting noticed by some old colleagues from Caltech. Here we get the exposition that Walt actually started Grey Matter with Elliot, along with how they came up with the name of the business by combining their last names together. Back when Elliot and I were in grad school, we came up with the name <clears throat> Schwartz Black Walter White, so together they became Grey Matter Technologies. Thank you, Doc. When Walt gets misunderstood as still running the company with Elliot, he plays it off by stating that he became an educator instead, but dodges the following question of what university he teaches at, as he's clearly embarrassed that he actually works as an overqualified high school teacher instead. All the guests of the party then gather around Elliot for him to open up gifts, which is obviously in order to set up the situation of Elliot opening up Walt's gift in front of everybody, even though it's kind of a gag gift. This setup initially seems odd, and I feel like the creators were self-aware of that fact, so they had Skylar whisper to Walt, mocking Elliot by questioning why he's doing this as if he's an 8 year old at his birthday party. She may also be saying this to downplay the inevitable, as she knows that Walt is nervous about what Elliot will think of his gift. Stupid gift. No, it isn't. He'll love it. I don't know what I was thinking. Didn't the invitation even say no gifts? God, would you look at that? The invitation said no gifts. Why is Beautiful. He what is he, like eight years old? So although Walt's gag gift of a pack of noodles initially comes across as passive aggressive, Elliot sincerely accepts it, recognizing it as what Walt and he practically survived off of when they used to work together. It's interesting how genuinely great of a guy Elliot seems to be, as he's completely oblivious to the resentment that Walt has festered towards him over the years. Plus, I'm unsure of if Gretchen ever even discussed her falling out with Walt to Elliot, as she most likely just covered for him. This was our lifeblood. Man, where'd you find these? I thought they'd been outlawed years ago. I love it. Thank you, Walt. We then cut to Elliot and Walt afterwards, reminiscing about their past experiences together, and to be honest, they truly get along like two peas in a pod. Seeing them catch up feels like two old friends instantly clicking again after not seeing each other in forever, yet they're able to pick up right where things left off. Walt does seem to be willing to bury the hatchet in regard to his secret resentment against Elliot, as he seems to be genuinely enjoying himself here, and he even offers Elliot and Gretchen over for dinner sometime, which does seem to be more than just an empty gesture. All that gets thrown out the window, however, when Elliot offers Walt a job at Grey Matter, as he implies that he knows about Walt's condition. 
See, Walt does seem to initially consider the offer, but when he decides to actually open up to Elliot about his cancer, Elliot seems to already know what he's talking about before he can even say what the issue is, causing Walt to realize that Skylar already told him. There's something you should know. There's nothing we can't work out. No. Yeah, but it's, it's complicated. We, we have excellent health insurance. The best. Considering how difficult it was for Walt to open up to anybody about his diagnosis, even his immediate family, it's clear that Walt cares deeply about deciding who he opens up about his condition to. Due to this, Skylar already telling Elliot made Walt feel like she violated his privacy, along with taking away him having the choice to tell Elliot or not himself. Also, due to this, Walt feels like Elliot only offered him the job due to finding out about his cancer, which makes it feel like charity, instead of Elliot actually coming to the conclusion himself and offering him the job due to genuinely missing having him as a friend. Now, I'm sure that Elliot does miss him as he even says so, but Walt feels like Elliot only had this realization due to learning about his condition first. This is also why Elliot probably became so sentimental towards Walt's gag gift, as it does hit close to home after just learning through Skylar about Walt's cancer. Now, in regard to Walt's ego, what Elliot is offering is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to essentially solve all of his problems along with giving him what he feels like he's always deserved. Any normal person would have to be stupid to not take it, even if they have to swallow their pride in order to do so. Obviously, Walt ends up saying no, because if he said yes, we wouldn't have a show anymore, but the creators did such a great job building Walt's character in a way where it sadly makes complete sense why he'd deny Elliot's offer. If Walt wouldn't even accept leaning on Hank and Marie for potential financial aid from the last episode, he certainly doesn't want to lean on Elliot and Gretchen, especially after the years of resentment that he grew towards them. Now, I actually plan on dedicating an entire video to Gretchen and Elliot in the future, along with Grey Matter in general and the relationship in history between them and Walt, so I'll conclude this part of the discussion by saying how I absolutely love this ultimatum that Walt gives himself here. Does he suck it up and solve all of his problems in a legal and morally acceptable way by taking Elliot's offer, or does he deny the offer, instead turning back to a criminal lifestyle in order to provide for his family himself. I feel like just like with the Crazy 8 snitch reveal, Elliot's offer and the ultimatum that Walt is given is something that is easily overlooked or forgotten about by many viewers during their first time watching the show. Many casual viewers feel like Walt is validated in needing to continue down a criminal path through the five total seasons of the show in order to provide for his family, which initially seems noble, but in reality he doesn't need to do it at all as taking Elliot's offer would have essentially solved all of his problems and given him everything he's ever wanted in life. Due to this, I feel like this episode, and more specifically Elliot's party, is one of, if not the most important scene out of the entirety of season 1. Meanwhile, Jesse teams up with Badger to cook a batch, and you can instantly tell how Walt's knowledge and love for chemistry has really rubbed off on him, as he's instantly able to identify the difference between all the flasks and paraphernalia, along with what they're used for, which is a direct contrast to the scene in episode 1. Griffin Beakers, your Erlenmeyer flask, but the piece de resistance round bottom boiling flask, 5,000 milliliters. It's a boiling flask. This is a beaker. Here's a Griffin beaker, here's a uh, volumetric beaker. Here's a, an Erlenmeyer flask. No, this is a volumetric flask. You wouldn't cook in one of these. Uh, yeah. I do. Uh, no, you don't. Okay, so he hasn't quite learned everything exactly, but he's at least trying. I also love how Jesse directly quotes what Walt said to him after he was amazed at Walt's high quality cook in episode one as well. Actually, it's just basic chemistry. It's just basic chemistry, yo. We get another cook montage as Jesse and Badger whip up a batch, and it's kind of interesting to realize how our second ever cook montage is actually with Badger, not Walt. So with Jesse attempting to take up the mantle from Walt, Badger is essentially to Jesse what Jesse was to Walt. However, as much as Jesse has learned from Walt, he's clearly frustrated over not yet being at the same level, as he's unsatisfied with how their product turned out, even if it's above average. He's so unsatisfied, in fact, that he dumps the entire tray of crystal out in the desert, causing Badger to understandably freak out over it. It seems like knowledge isn't the only thing that rubbed off on Jesse from Walt, as Jesse has now become incredibly prideful in the art of high quality chemistry to the point that he's now developed somewhat of an ego about it himself. I mean, he always thought that cooking was art, as he told Walt in episode 1, but after cooking the best batch of his life with Walt, he wants to live up to that expectation from now on. I understand Jesse wanting to get it right, but he definitely doesn't need to waste two entire batches, as that's a lot of money, even if it's not the quality he wants. 
I mean, let's say they kept the batches and sold them, they'd hypothetically cook again after selling it all anyways, right? So in theory, Jesse could have gotten the practice in while keeping his less than satisfactory cooks, it just would have taken some time and patience. Anyways, after essentially chucking out both batches, Badger becomes enraged, causing them to fight it out, resulting in Jesse actually abandoning him in the desert, which is pretty brutal. Side note, I love how Badger picks up Jesse and gives him a helicopter in reference to the sign spinning move that he mentioned at the beginning of the episode. The helicopter. <laughs> helicopter, bitch! Meanwhile, Junior gets arrested for trying to get a random stranger to boo liquor for him, unaware that he's actually a cop. This causes him to call Hank to pick him up instead of his own father, pretending that Hank is his dad. Just like with the weed situation, Hank feels uncomfortable as he thinks that Walt should have handled this himself, but it makes sense that Junior called Hank instead of Walt for multiple reasons. First, Hank is a DEA agent. Second, Hank has looked out for him before. And the third and biggest reason is that Junior is clearly angry at Walt for not wanting to fight his cancer, which may have been what caused Junior to lash out by trying to get liquor in the first place. So after Hank brings Junior back home, Marie and Skylar are there waiting for him to discuss what just happened. Hank and Marie bring up how they thought Junior was smoking weed, causing Skylar to admit that it was actually Walt who admitted it to her himself, not Junior. I love how Hank laughs it off thinking that Walt didn't have it in him, instead of getting mad considering he's a DEA agent. Skylar essentially suggests that they hold Walt in intervention, but hilariously refuses to acknowledge it as such. This brings us to the talking pillow scene, where Walt has to sit there silently and listen to his entire family air out their grievances in result to Walt not wanting to take the treatment, which is exactly why Walt didn't want to tell them in the first place. That being said, Walt does a great job respecting the entire situation as Walt's family goes around and states their opinions. Skyler gives a genuine and heartfelt explanation as to why he should take the treatment. Hank gives some hilarious analogies, essentially backing up Skyler, while also recognizing Walt's pride. Junior then explains how after everything he's been through in regard to his own condition, he wants Walt to fight the same way that he has his entire life, which is extremely powerful, as Walt giving up after everything Junior had to go through seems kind of hypocritical. Then as we get to Marie, she unexpectedly goes against the grain and backs up Walt, stating how since it's ultimately his life, he should be able to make his own decision about it. Skylar freaks out at Marie for not backing her up, showing how she essentially wanted all of them to team up against Walt as a united front, with the point of this intervention being Skylar hoping that four against one would essentially overrule Walt and force his hand. Although Skylar means well, I commend Marie for actually speaking her mind, which is what this talking pillow scene is genuinely supposed to be. Now an argument breaks out amongst the family, with Walt hearing enough, finally grabbing the talking pillow to speak his own mind, which is a moment that I also love. All right, I've got the talking pillow now. Walt essentially explains how he feels like he hasn't been able to make his own choices his entire life, causing him to want to finally be able to do so with this final one, cancer. Walt makes some great points about how surviving an extra year or two may not be worth it if he's in such poor condition that he's unable to enjoy it. Walt explains how living as long as possible isn't the only thing that matters, as he considers the quality of the remainder of his life above all. Walt continues his thoughts by stating how if he did take the treatment, they'd only remember him in his final moments in a horribly sick bedridden state instead of the man that he truly is, which he considers to be the worst part. Not only is this incredibly relatable, Walt has his own very personal reason for taking this stance that's revealed in a future season in regard to his own father, so put a pin in that for now as we'll return to it in a future video. Now, although he genuinely means everything that he just said, after some time alone to think it all through, he decides that he does want to go through with the treatment in consideration of what his family wants, especially after seeing all the cancer books on his end table, showing how much Skylar truly cares about his well-being. I just love how Walt is able to finally speak his mind but still goes along with the treatment which makes it feel like a truly selfless act in the love that he has for his family and how this is all affecting them. Also, whether or not someone with cancer decides to take chemo is a very popular real life conflict that can completely divide a family, so I appreciate the way that the show portrays this dilemma and approaches it. Walt then unexpectedly gets a call from Gretchen while in his car, as Elliot has now told her about his cancer, along with him turning down Elliot's offer to pay for his treatments. 
Gretchen gives a sincere and heartfelt gesture about how he has to take the money, since as far as they're concerned, it should be his money, as even half of the name of the company is his. Although Walt does agree that half of the company should be his, he's clearly insulted that the cancer is what caused Gretchen to admit this, as he's had the urge to be validated about this his entire life. Just like with Elliot's job offer, Walt would have only felt happy about it if they would have genuinely come to these conclusions all on their own, without his cancer aiding them in their decisions and realization. Regardless, you can tell that Gretchen really cares about him, even asking if his reluctance to accept their offer is due to his past with her. Walt doesn't acknowledge this and instead lies, saying how his own insurance is covering his treatment, brushing her off. We then realize that Walt is actually parked outside of Jesse's house, and the episode ends with Walt confronting Jesse, asking if he wants to cook, which is an incredibly iconic moment in my opinion, as this gives us the answer to the ultimatum that I mentioned earlier, where Walt would prefer to continue doing criminal activity in order to provide for his family and pay for his treatments, instead of accepting Gretchen and Elliot's offer. That's also why he talked to Gretchen the way that he did while he was in the car, because he was already outside Jesse's house, he already made up his mind. Plus, Walt asking Jesse if he wants to cook has definitely spawned some of the we need to cook Jesse memes. Now, in regard to what I want to rank this episode, I've honestly been struggling with whether to give it a strong A tier or even an S tier, but the fact that I have to give it so much thought makes me feel like I should just say screw it and put it in S tier. I still think I like episode 3 more, but I do honestly admit that I like this episode even more than the pilot. From the whole grey matter situation to the talking pillow scene, this episode once again proves that this show can have some incredibly important and moving scenes without needing any action at all as the incredibly strong writing and acting go hand in hand in causing the show to become the true masterpiece that it is. Season 1 Episode 6 Crazy Handful and Nothing this episode starts out with potentially the most hype cold open of the entire season, as we get given a huge juxtaposition between Walt telling Jesse how he wants them to operate moving forward, contrasted with quick glimpses of a flash forward to Walt with a completely shaved head, walking away from what we eventually learn is Tuco's hideout that he operates out of. The cold open starts with Walt walking into the RV, realizing that Jesse attempted to cook without him, causing Walt to state how he handles the chemistry, while Jesse handles the distribution. Not only that, but Walt wants to be the silent partner of the two of them, as he doesn't want any connection with anyone else that Jesse deals with, and he doesn't want to be involved with any more bloodshed or violence in general, with the flash forward clearly going against absolutely everything that we just heard Walt tell Jesse. Before we get into any of that, however, we see Walt in chemo as he lies to Skylar about receiving payment from Elliot for his treatment. Then, we see Walt once again teaching his chemistry class, talking about how a rapid chemical reaction can cause a sunburst energy, aka an explosion, with fulminated mercury being his prime example of it. You probably see where I'm headed with this, but this scene perfectly foreshadows what Walt does at Tuco's during the end of the episode that we saw a glimpse of in the flash forward. I love how Walt, using his knowledge of chemistry to his advantage against his foes, is foreshadowed again in this episode, just like how it was with the toxic gas that Walt used against Emilio and Crazy Aid in episode 1. We then see Walt with Skylar and Junior at a cancer support group meeting as Walt is confronted on what he's doing when he's mysteriously gone for long periods of time. Instead of completely coming up with flat out lies, Walt actually gives a half truth, as speaking about going out and enjoying nature, such as the cacti in the desert, is somewhat true, as he's pulling from his experience cooking with Jesse. However, whereas he leaves his excuse with the idea of going out for walks and nature being therapeutic, he's actually thinking about cooking crystal, clearly implied by the show showing us incredibly cinematic shots of the RV out in the desert feeling therapeutic in itself, which is iconic imagery that the show is known for. Speaking of which, this perfect transition into Walt and Jesse cooking again is an incredibly important scene between the two of them for multiple reasons. First off, Walt is forced to take a break due to working himself too hard, but when he takes off half of his equipment due to overheating, Jesse realizes that he has cancer because of the radiation mark on his chest. Jesse reveals that he surprisingly knows a lot about cancer due to it being how his aunt died, who is a character that gets subtly referenced throughout the show since episode 1, but never so much so that you really pick up on the full story unless you put all the pieces together yourself. Jesse's aunt got diagnosed with cancer, so Jesse took care of her during her final days, which is why Jesse 
took over living at her house after she passed away. This not only explains how a junkie dealer could live in his own house considering he doesn't make enough to pay for it, but also gives perfect explanation as to why Jesse knows so much about cancer. Now, the second reason why this scene is so important between the two of them is due to Walt allowing Jesse to take over for him and finish their current batch, which directly goes against what he told Jesse in the cold open. This shows that although Walt values his pride, ego, and passion for chemistry above all else, he's willing to confide in and rely on Jesse when he needs to, showing how he believes that Jesse is more capable than he initially let on. Meanwhile, Hank realizes that the gas mask that they found from the original cook site actually came from Walt's high school, due to discovering traces of a mark saying JP win on the inside. More on that in a moment, but for now we get a great montage of Jesse wheeling and dealing Crystal all night long at well-known Breaking Bad locations such as the Crossroad Motel and the 24-7 Doghouse. The following scene shows Jesse meeting up with Walt in the desert to cook once more, along with bringing him the profits that he made the night before. I absolutely love this scene as it shows the total disconnect that Walt has in regard to having absolutely no concept of how selling drugs works. And this is kind of why Walt and Jesse are such a perfect team. Walt Walt is a professional chemist, while Jesse is, I suppose you could say, a professional drug dealer of sorts, or at least one with enough experience to know better. In other words, Walt has book smarts, while Jesse has street smarts, with them having to meet in the middle to help each other understand their respective talents, so to speak. You just don't get it, man. Okay, this guy's OG. What, what, what does that mean? Walt hilariously thinks that Jesse could sell $26,000 worth of crystal in one night, and is still disappointed at that idea. So as you can imagine, when Jesse tells him that it's only $26,000, hundreds split between the two of them, Walt is even more enraged. Jesse admits that he sold nearly an ounce the previous night, which is pretty good considering he essentially is selling dime baggies individually. Now since they cooked an entire pound for their last batch, Walt hilariously accuses Jesse of smoking the remaining 15 ounces. Although Walt is being hyperbolic here, this again clearly shows how Walt has no idea how much drugs a pound of crystal truly is, along with how little someone would actually need to smoke at a time. Walt then questions why Jesse can't and simply sell the entire pound at once, again undermining the severity of how big of a deal that would actually be. Walt then asks how they can realistically sell their product in wholesale, but Jesse gives Walt a hard time for killing the only distributor that he knows, which is yet another moment that I absolutely love. What do you mean, to like a distributor? Yes. Yes! That's what we need. We need a distributor now. Do you know anyone like that? Yeah, I mean, I used to. Until you killed him. Jesse brings up how Tuco took over Crazy 8's place, when in reality, Tuco has always been at an even higher level, which was brilliantly elaborated on during Better Call Saul, which gave us full context of the hierarchy in place here, along with the fact that Tuco is heavily involved with the cartel due to being a Salamanca. So Jesse explains how you essentially can't just walk up to a cartel member that you've never met before and ask him to cut a deal with you for tens of thousands of dollars. When Walt asks who introduced Jesse to Crazy 8, he admits how it was Emilio, giving his context about how Jesse has known Emilio since grade school, along with again giving Walt flack over the fact that they killed him too. Well, who introduced you to Crazy 8? Emilio, that's only because I knew him from like third grade, and we can't talk to Emilio either. All right, all right, all right, all right. The scene ends with Walt yelling at Jesse to throw some fucking balls, which as we'll soon see, turns out to be horrible advice. Also, if you couldn't tell by the fact that I literally broke this scene down sentence by sentence, I absolutely love it. In fact, I'd go as far to say that this scene is definitely one of my favorite scenes out of the entire season, all things considered. Again, I just can't get enough in regard to the on-screen chemistry between Walt and Jesse, which is where the magic of this show truly happens. So after class at JP win, Walt gets a surprise visit by Hank, who wants to run some work-related questions by him. Walt is initially completely oblivious, that is until he sees Hank pull out the very gas mask that he threw away in episode one, causing him to practically crap his pants, even though he does a good job hiding it. Not only does Hank explain everything surrounding the mask, he also drops the bomb that Crazy 8 was a snitch of his, something that Walt is extremely surprised to hear, especially since Hank is unknowingly speaking to the person who literally murdered him as he explains to Walt how he thinks that Crazy 8 was somehow killed. As if that wasn't bad enough, as Hank is looking over Walt's inventory and realizing that a lot is missing, Walt inconveniently gets a call from Jesse, which Hank insists that he answers, clearly unaware of who it is. Jesse informs Walt that he's going to bring Tuco a pound due to Skinny Pete being able to vouch for him. So you sure you're tight with this guy? 
two nuts in a ball sack, yo. But Walters hangs up while covering to Hank that it was a doctor. Hank completely ignores this, however, as he confronts Walt on how some junkie went to town stealing a ton of his inventory. Hank then says two things here that stick out to me, with the first being how he tells Walt that he needs to watch over his turf, which unintentionally foreshadows future seasons. The second, and more obvious, is that Hank says that they wouldn't want people to suspect Walt, which obviously creates a ton of tension here since although Hank is clearly joking, Walt is actually the culprit. This is the first of many times that the show does this throughout its run, such as the WW, you got me scene, or the half a million in cash scene, just to name a few. I love how by this point, the viewers are able to start putting two and two together in regard to the cold open flash forward, especially after Jesse's meeting with Tuco inevitably goes wrong. Considering that Jesse and Skinny are at the same building that we saw the clean shaven Walt walk away from, even though Skinny was apparently in the same cell block as Tuco, that doesn't mean once they're on the outside as Tuco robs Jesse of the pound that he brought him and brutally beats him up to boot with Skinny just standing there watching. Two nuts in a ball sack, my ass. Wait, that didn't come out right. Wait. Anyways, I'd be remiss to simply gloss over the introduction of Tuco, as he's become so iconic that essentially every line he speaks has become its own meme. From Booyah! Wow! <laughs> this, this kicks like a meal with his balls wrapped in duct tape. To Alright, you brought me some really clean crystal. Ooh. Or even Nobody moves crystal in the South Valley but me! Raymond Cruz does an excellent job portraying Tuco, so it's an understandable shame that it affected him so heavily that he didn't want to play the character more than he had to going into season 2. With that in mind, I feel blessed that we got to see him reprise his role in Better Call Saul at all. Speaking of which, as a side note, although I love how Better Call Saul elaborated on Tuco being in prison up until 2007, I wish that we would have seen a scene of Skinny and Tuco in prison together, but oh well, I digress. Oh yeah, also we get introduced to Tuco's henchmen, Nodos and Gonzo, but they're not really important until the following 2-3 episodes. But moving on, after school the following day, both Walt and Junior witness Hank arresting the school janitor Hugo, who I think we can all unanimously agree is the true MVP of the season. Hugo has helped clean up after Walt, throwing up in the bathroom multiple times now due to nausea from his chemo. And now Hugo appears to be, at least temporarily, taking the fall for potentially stealing the lab equipment from Walt's chemistry class. We then see Walt trying to call Jesse a few nights later, but he gets no answer. So he goes back to playing poker with his family, to which Junior asks Hank about why he arrested Hugo, which gives us the exposition as to why Hank did so. Since Walt knows that Hugo is innocent, he defends him by stating how he doesn't seem like a thief, to which Hank undermines him by saying how Walt wouldn't know the first thing about recognizing a criminal, which again is incredibly ironic for obvious reasons. Hank then proceeds to admit how after raiding Hugo's place, although they discovered that he turned out to be a huge stoner, he didn't steal Walt's lab equipment after all, leading Hank to again ironically wonder if Walt's hiding something due to him somehow knowing that Hugo was in fact innocent in the crime that he's investigating. I feel like this is a good enough time as any to mention how, although it's a tad too convenient that Walt's brother-in-law just so happens to be a DEA agent just to add suspense into the story, I will admit how the show plays it off perfectly in regard to the cat and mouse chase of Walt constantly hiding right under Hank's nose throughout the entire series as it adds up personal relation to the law enforcement trying to track Walt down instead of it just being some random typical DEA agent. Most shows that set up things like this feel completely contrived, but in regard to Breaking Bad, I have absolutely no problem with it at all, and I actually really enjoy it. Also, Walt playing cards against Hank is a clear analogy in regard to the cat and mouse chase that I just mentioned, as everyone in the family folds but them, leaving Walt to decide to go all in versus Hank due to Hank taunting him to either man up or puss out. Hank accuses him of being a horrible liar, which again is ironic for obvious reasons. This may hit it right on the nose a tad too much for some, but I really enjoy it, as Hank folds, causing Marie to reveal their cards, showing how Hank had a great hand, while Walt did in fact have a handful of nothing. Which is where the name of the episode comes from. I love this show. The following morning, Walt starts to notice some hair loss due to chemo, foreshadowing the inevitable that we saw in the cold open. Walt once again calls Jesse's number with Skinny picking up, causing Walt to visit Jesse in the hospital and discover what's happened. Walt feels immense guilt due to pushing Jesse to go speak to Tuco, which he now realizes was horrible advice, so he gets Skinny to tell him everything he knows about Tuco as Walt now plans to enact revenge. The following morning, we see Walt taking his handful of daily pills, which reference the talking pillow scene from the last episode where this is exactly what Walt said he didn't want to do. I want to live in my own house. I want to sleep in my own bed. 
I don't want to choke down 30 or 40 pills every single day and lose my hair. Some dead man, some artificially alive, just marking time. He even notices more hair loss, causing him to fully embrace it, surprising his family by him completely shaving off his hair. I absolutely love how Skylar and Junior have completely opposite reactions to Walt's shaved head, as it leaves Skylar completely speechless, while Junior calls it badass dad in such a seemingly proud cadence, with this being the moment that Walter White became Heisenberg. By this point, many viewers probably have all the pieces necessary to completely put two and two together in regard to what's about to happen next, which is a perfect example of viewers' potential potentially feeling validated for being able to accurately predict how the episode will end. Oh, and if this sounds at all familiar due to you having potentially seen my recent Better Call Saul video on Lalo Salamanca, this is how you get it done by the way. So Walt arrives at Tugo's hideout, paralleling Jesse doing the same earlier, from Walt confronting the guard outside, getting buzzed in after staring at the security camera, to Tugo's henchmen even finding another bag of supposed crystal on him after patting him down. However, this is where the parallel diverges, as Walt doesn't just sit down like Jesse did and instead continues standing, as he states that he won't be there for very long. Walt introduces himself as Heisenberg for the first time on screen, then boldly announced that Tuco owes him $50,000 due to 35k from the pound that he stole from Jesse, along with 15k for his pain and suffering. Tuco initially laughs in his face, falling right into Walt's trap, calling him out for supposedly bringing him even more crystal, leading right into the iconic This is not me moment with Walt creating an explosion by throwing a single crystal at the ground. Walt then uses everyone being hazed from the situation to his advantage to grab the rest of the bag and hold them at not gunpoint, bag point, chemistry point, whatever. Walt implies the threat of throwing the rest of the bag on the ground which would cause a fatal explosion causing Tuco to pay up. As Tuco gives Walt the money, he requests Walt to bring him another pound the following week as the initial pound sold like hotcakes. Walt then starts the trend of him requesting double the production order to his buyer, demanding that Tuco accepts two pounds instead of one. Then when Tuco asks what the explosives even are, Walt sorry, Heisenberg reveals how it's fulminated mercury, a little tweak of chemistry giving an epic payoff to the seemingly insignificant classroom scene near the beginning of the episode. This episode then ends coming full circle to the cold open as Walt exits the building and walks to his car with a bag full of $50,000, completely losing it once he gets in the car due to the adrenaline rush that the whole situation just gave him. It's funny how Walt initially told Jesse to throw some fucking balls, when in reality Walt ended up taking his own advice. No surprise here, but this episode gets an S tier, easy, and I feel like I've already gushed enough about it explaining why, so let's go ahead and jump right into the Season 1 finale. Season 1 Episode 7, a no rough stuff type deal. The Season 1 finale starts with Walt getting uncomfortably frisky towards Skylar during a meeting at his school with the APD and DEA to discuss the current situation in regard to Hugo's arrest along with the stolen lab equipment. This continues to depict the trend of Walt's sex drive skyrocketing over the rush of doing something illegal, as he blatantly states as they finish having car sex directly afterward. This rush may still be from what happened in the last episode, or the fact that he's the mysterious culprit that the entire meeting is even about, along with participating in these lewd acts being a risk in itself. Walt then goes to visit Jesse at his place to give him his share of the money from Tuco, but discovers that Jesse is selling his house due to feeling like it's haunted after what they did to Emilio and Chris. Crazy eight. I love how the conversation casually switches between the two topics as Walt casually informs Jesse that he made a deal with Tuco after Tuco gave him what he owed them. I love how Jesse goes from being surprised and impressed that Walt got Tuco to pay him $50,000 to instantly getting pissed off that he made a deal with Tuco without first asking him. Jesse is upset that Walt made this deal without first discussing it with him as he explains how there's a bottleneck problem in providing two pounds of crystal every week as Jesse is unable to acquire the pseudo necessary to do so. So without a solution to this problem when they meet up with Tuco, they're only able to provide a half pound. Also, Walt decided to meet Tuco at a junkyard which Jesse mocks as it's hilariously a non-criminal's idea of a private drug meet that you'd see on TV since he usually likes to make deals in public areas so it's less likely for him to get ripped off. So where do you transact your business? Enlighten me. I don't know, uh, how about Taco Cabeza? 
Half the deals I've ever done went down at Taco Cabeza. Nice and public, open 24 hours. Nobody ever gets shot at Taco Cabeza. I also got to highlight the more comedic lines from Jesse here as he vouches for doing deals at Taco Cabeza as an example. Once Tuco arrives, he even hilariously calls out the fact that they're doing a deal at a junkyard instead of at the mall like Jesse previously mentioned. Hell, why not the mall? You know, wait at the gap. Hey, it's time for the meet. Hey, what are we doing way the hell out here? What, they close the mall or something? So Tuco gets understandably pissed at them for only having a quarter of what they should, but in order to try and keep leverage over him, Walt tries acting like a badass by first demanding the full payment in advance, along with doubling the deal again, this time from two to four pounds, and as he does so, I just love Jesse's shocked reaction. Tuco demands weekly interest and rightfully calls him out for his big talk not meaning much if he can't back up his words. Back at Jesse's, we get the iconic, Yeah, Mr. White! Yes, science! From Jesse as Walt explains that he actually has a plan to produce a four pound cook without using any pseudo. However, after seeing the large shopping list of items required, Jesse wimps out due to being completely clueless as to what any of it even is. Walt convinces him to do so by saying how he's the only one who can, which I'm pretty sure is a lie. Walt just doesn't want to be personally seen buying these items himself. We then cut to Skylar's baby shower as the whole family essentially gives time capsule vlogs to Holly for once she's all grown up. It's all fun and games until Walt shows up, realizing that he's essentially leaving a video message for his daughter as he'll be long dead before she ever grows up to get to know him, which is an incredibly somber yet beautiful moment. Also, although Walt not living long enough to see Holly grow up is obvious at this point, spoiler alert for season 5, in retrospect, there's another person in the family that won't see Holly grow up either, which makes this that much more tragic. Hank and Walt go outside to get some air as Hank feels bad already knowing that Marie had stolen the baby tiara present that she gave to Skylar as a gift. I also absolutely love this outside scene between Hank and Walt for a multitude of reasons. When Hank takes out some cigars, Walt not only says it's okay, but even asks for one himself, stating how he already has lung cancer, which always gets a smile out of me. Then when Walt realizes that the cigars are Cuban, he jokingly gives Hank a hard time for it. This continues to show that although Hank is a DEA agent, he himself is somewhat morally gray and slightly biased when in regard to himself and his own family. He never came down hard on Junior or Walt for smoking pot. He Help Junior get out of getting caught for trying to boot liquor, and now he even shares an illegal cigar with Walt. As he even says, forbidden fruit tastes the sweetest, which Walt is well aware of, made pretty obvious by the cold open. Walt then blurs the line of what's acceptable or not based on current legality, and wonders what will be legalized in the future. Hank instantly jumps to pod for obvious reasons, but Walt is more focused on the harder stuff, clearly showing how he doesn't think that cooking crystal is as bad as it really is. This also clashes with Hank admitting how crystal used to be legal but it isn't anymore, stating how he's thankful that the government came to their senses, which is the exact opposite of what Walt was trying to get out of him. So Walt lies to Skylar about going to a sweat lodge for the weekend in order to cover the amount of time that he'll need to spend with Jesse to fulfill their deal with Tuco. As Walt arrives, he commends Jesse for doing such a good job getting everything on their shopping list, while minus the new chemical that they need instead of pseudo. Side note, if you've noticed throughout this video, I've used words such as crystal in place of the big M word of the main drug that they cook in Breaking Bad bad due to YouTube censorship. Kinda of pathetic, I have to do so, but that's modern day YouTube for ya. Anyways, since this new chemical that they need has the M word in it, I'll be beating around the bush in regard to that too, just like my full story of Mike video. Just figured I'd throw that out there again in case any of you have been wondering. So Jesse admits that he knows some thieves that will get this chemical for them, but that they'd want $10,000 for the job, and that he's almost already out of money due to the rest of the shopping list being so expensive. Walt gets an epiphany looking at an etch a sketch and realizes that he can create thermite with what's inside, causing him to suggest that they should just steal what they need themselves. This is yet again another example of Walt putting his knowledge of chemistry to the test to solve their problems as we get a fun history lesson from Walt as he explains what a Gustav gun is in order to emphasize how powerful thermite really is, considering thermite was the weakness to destroy it. So that night, they go to do the barrel heist, but it wouldn't be a typical heist if something didn't go wrong in the middle of it. The guard suddenly comes back to go to the bathroom, giving Walt the bright idea to trap him inside the porta potty. I say that sarcastically, but it actually works. They successfully break open the lock with the thermite, causing the alarm to go off, with them frantically grabbing the first barrel that they see and getting the heck out of there. This gives us the hilarious shot of Walt and Jesse waddling the barrel past the guard stuck in the porta potty. And to be honest, I'm surprised that the show didn't do the gross cliche of having the porta potty fall over while the guard was stuck inside. Once back at Jesse's, the show continues the trend of the 
them having problems starting the RV, with it this time being the factor that causes them to feel forced to cook in Jesse's basement. Walt tells Jesse to call his real estate agent to call off the open house, but little do they know it's too late, as the real estate agent is already outside setting up. This gives us multiple comedic moments, such as Walt opening the basement door, getting caught by a small child, to which he hilariously shushes at her before slowly closing the door again. He then tasks Jesse with keeping the potential buyers out of the basement by any means necessary, causing Jesse to eventually have to yell at everyone to get out of that the house is not for sale after all. Meanwhile, Skylar goes to return the baby tiara, but gets wrongfully detained due to them telling her how it's been stolen. We see how Skylar has a few tricks up her own sleeves, as she plays up being the victim to the point that she pretends to go into labor in order to get herself out of the situation. Although the Marie Klepto plot is widely regarded as unliked, I do enjoy this scene with Skylar. Skylar then finally finds Marie at a store and confronts her about all of this, as Marie's been clearly avoiding her. Although I'm not really a fan of this internal conflict, I will admit how Betsy Branded does a great job pretending to not know what Skylar's talking about in such a way that infuriates me just as much as it does Skylar, which is obviously the writer's intentions. Walt finally returns home after finishing up cooking the batch with Jesse, but due to him becoming progressively more careless while doing so, Skylar can smell the cook on him, causing him to have to come up with the excuse of it being from his retreat. This is a very subtle point, but Walt from episode 1 was extremely careful to cover his tracks, which is why he stripped down to his underwear as he didn't want his clothes to smell. Here, however, Walt literally comes home smelling like a fresh cook, which is something that he stated he didn't want back in episode 1. What are you doing? These are my good clothes. You can't go home smelling like a meth lab. What's that smell? Oh, yeah, those sacred Navajo herbs. Skylar then confronts Walt about the events regarding Marie and the stolen tiara, to which Walt plays devil's advocate by stating how people sometimes do wrong things for the right reasons, such as for their own family. This is clearly him relating to how he's cooking crystal to provide for his family. Skylar can't believe the words coming out of his mouth, causing him to hit the nail on the head in regard to the parallel he's projecting, asking Skylar what she'd do if he were in Marie's position. This clearly reminds me of Walt's talk with Hank earlier in regard to projecting his secret double life into the conversation, and just like with Hank, Walt doesn't hear the answer that he wants to hear from Skylar either, as she tells him that he doesn't want to find out what she'd do if he did the same thing to her that Marie has. The episode ends with Walt and Jesse meeting up with Tuco again at the junkyard, revealing their new blue crystal for the first time on screen, which is obviously due to their new formula substituting pseudo for the new chemical that they stole. Tuco is of course skeptical at first, but he's convinced after he tries it, giving us possibly the most iconic Tuco line out of them all. <coughs> Tight, 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 yeah! Oh, blue, yellow, pink! Whatever, man, just keep bringing me that. Everything seemingly goes down smoothly, that is until one of Tuco's henchmen, Nodo, speaks for him one too many times by reminding Walt and Jesse who they're working for. Now, granted, what Tuco does to him next is wrong on so many levels, but Better Call Saul does elaborate on the fact that Nodo has been unnecessarily speaking for him for years, emphasizing how it's been repeat annoyance that has finally gotten on Tuco's nerves for the last time. For what it's worth, I absolutely love this scene, from Tuco asking Nodo's if he thinks that Walt and Jesse are stupid followed by himself, resulting in the misdirect of Tuco essentially beating him to death right after you think that Walt has successfully calmed Tuco down. As Walt and Jesse flinch with every punch that Tuco makes, it clearly solidifies to them that working with Tuco sadly isn't the reliable long-term partnership that they initially thought. Wow! Damn, man, look at that, look! This episode gets an A tier. It's a great finale to wrap up the first season, but I still feel like I enjoy the previous episode more. That being said, the season 1 finale did make me want to just instantly jump into season 2 and start covering that as well, but season 2's time will come. So taking a look at my final rankings for the entirety of season 1, I think it's fairly balanced. To be honest, many people think that season 1 is their least favorite, which I may actually agree with, but only because this show gets better and better each season, which is a rare occurrence when it comes to serialized television. The thing about season 1 is that I've heard of many people who casually try watching it, sadly not be able to get past the first handful of episodes, causing them to drop the show before fully giving it a chance, which is a crying shame. That being said, for the people who do love the show, I think that season 1 offers even more during a rewatch since once you have the full context of the entire series, it's incredibly interesting to see the building blocks that started it all, especially since you will most likely notice certain subtle details that you didn't during your initial viewing. I'm so happy.
happy to be finally covering Breaking Bad in retrospect now that I've completely ranked Better Call Saul, as it's great to jump back to the original show now that the spinoff has properly concluded. Thanks to everyone who requested for me to cover Breaking Bad next, as it's going to be quite a ride in itself. Also, thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. I highly encourage you all to go check them out and give it a go, or at least click the link in the description to help make me look good in their eyes. With that being said, I'd appreciate a like on the video if you've enjoyed anything I've said today. Subscribe for more Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul retrospectives in the near future. But most importantly, I thank you all so much for watching, especially until the end of the video. And until next time, I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. My name is Skylar White, yo. My husband is Walter White, yo. Uh-huh.